massive legend here wanting to do another analysis video and a more richly detailed one over a YouTuber that despite some of his political opinions, I still value some of his criticisms in large part to the AAA industry. If the title wasn't already an indication, it is Jim Sterling, the then escapist video maker, the then destructoid journalist, who like Bob Chipman, but to an insanely lesser degree, had a falling out with the gaming crowd as a result of their more regressive leftist opinions bumping uglies of Aeneas Arkeesian's talking points. And I don't think I need to go into detail how full of shit those are. Unlike Chipman, who went full communist Mario, Jim Sterling is more of a SJW light, as I like to call him, where he sprinkles a bit of the social justice nonsense into some of his fire points, which is perhaps why, in spite of how Rags or Sargon of Akkad dismiss him as a viable games critic, still manages a pretty healthy viewer to sub ratio, and I still check out his Jimquisition videos from time to time. But of course, the big question comes then, why is it that several gamers are a bit off-put by what Jim Sterling has to say about video games and gamers in question? I have a number of reasons to point this out, but rather than blow via it as I do, let's take a time machine way, way back before Jim left the Escapist, and before he left Destructoid, but not for ideological reasons, I believe, to his most earliest and hand-picked Jimquisitions that puts a big red light to allusions to Nia's horrible talking points. Of course, I'm not going to respond entirely to the videos I play here, but pick out the worst aspects of his arguments and explain why it is wrong and how it makes some people doubtful of his viability as a games critic. Now, believe it or fucking not, starting with his second video in the entire series of all things, Jim Sterling made an episode called Solving the Sexism Situation, in which he downplayed the number of people pre Anita Sarkeesian who were taking jokes and video games out of context and trying to make it seem like sexualization of women in said games was inherently wrong. Take this little clip as evidence for it. Sexism in gaming is a hot potato issue right now. We've had talk of Penny Arcade making jokes about dick wolves, David Jaffe comparing technology to vaginas, and we've also had Duke Nukem Forever's Capture the Babe, a game mode in which you punch women in the face with a boxing glove strapped to the end of your cock. Well, that's only if you believe Fox News. You actually give her a smack on the arse now and then. However, that is still a rather sensitive subject with many women. But I'm sure that Doom Nukem Forever is the kind of robust intellectual forum in which to explore these problems. What am I, a chimpanzee? In many cases, I think the issue of sexism is overblown, and it's very easy to get caught up in our inability to differentiate jokes from actual instances of hatred. In fact, I don't think we as a community even deserve to have these discussions if we're still going to get up in arms over a simple little joke and rob games, comments, and any kind of humour of its context just to focus on the bit that we find particularly offensive. <laughs> That said, there is a serious issue to be had, and that's to be found in the disproportionate sexualization of women in games. However, that's not a problem I think necessarily has to, shall we say, go away. You see, here's a simple truth. Men like to look at tits. I'm sorry if a few people find that offensive, but that's simply the way we're wired. I didn't come up with the concept. It's a little thing we call fucking genetics, and it's the reason why the human species is here. Men like to, I guess, objectify women because that's what they've evolved to do. Now, I guarantee you the 2017 Jim would be up in arms over this, but let's not forget that Jim does address some issue with objectification of women in games, in spite of said objectification going both ways in the media that a majority of number of women enjoy. Of course, right after this bit, Jim makes the false economy that all women are clad in armor that is designed to show their body, and rather humorously suggests that men should be just as clad as women are in said armor, as well as bringing up that women objectify men in a number of ways as well, go to defiant art and tight double may cry as his proof. So what happened that dramatically changed Jim's perception on this, you ask? Honestly, I've never even seen this video myself, as I probably started watching into the first 20 or so videos. But let's find out for ourselves, shall we? Fast forward about a year into the Jim position, and we see Jim delving into the controversy that was Phil Fish being a racist to Japanese people over their games and people expressing their dismay by boycotting his only game, Fez, for it. 
If you aren't familiar with Phil Fish, well, let's just say that he's a massive white knight for the very same feminist who would more than likely castrate him before letting him suck their toes. Why I bring this up is that Jim would eventually go on to defend Anita and company in spite of his advocacy for separating the artist from the arts, such as with Phil Fish supposedly being a racist in spite of his game. Here's a clip for context. That said, anybody who is a fan of Ten April or Card's work and wants to support the art as opposed to the artist, well, I don't have a problem with them. I think on some level we're all good at compartmentalising, depending on the product and the people involved. What I find tasteless, others may not. Who I find objectionable, others may find charming. Now, I've said plenty of dickish and outright stupid things myself in the past, and I don't blame anybody who chooses not to support my work due to that. On the flip side, if we all stopped buying games that had an arsehole on the development team, we'd likely never buy another game again, given the high number of pricks in the world. It's always a fascinating debate to have in any case, and in many ways I'm glad to see this debate coming up more often in games. Now one thing we do need to be mindful of is that just because one guy on the team is an arse piece, that doesn't mean everybody else is. Few games are created by a single person, and even Fez had quite a few folks working on it. It's hard to remember that given how many game directors become the face of their product. There's a benefit to that given that an outspoken mouthpiece can make headlines, but the exclusive association with a certain personality is a risk as well, given that if the personality rubs people the wrong way, it could damage the game's reputation overall. Jim would also later contradict this point by saying that gamers who play games made by developers who hate Anita are in support of misogyny, so again, it surprises me how much Jim has changed, but of course, it was only until a fateful Jimquisition upload on October 24th of 2012 that Jim polished his white knight bride and protected his madame for the vain hope of getting a screw. That was a joke because he's married and probably does get a screw. Nevertheless, it was here that Jim started to show his more SJW side with believing that Anita got any amount of harassment that wasn't self-given, I might add, that of which catapulted her success as a media feminist in spite of how the very harassment she claimed to have received after getting her Kickstarter going was the reason that it earned so much money to begin with, because a bunch of white knights couldn't see Madame getting attacked by the trolls without their two-inch cocks to stop them before realizing that they were fighting for nothing. Let's face facts, ladies and gentlemen. Until she was hit with an onslaught of rape threats, death threats, and gendered racist slurs, Anita was just another Kickstarter user, trying to raise funds for what was, in all honesty, a not altogether spectacular project. As I expected. You know what's funny, too, about this video looking back? I actually knew nothing of Anita Sarkeesian at this time, and was all on Jim's side about this issue since I didn't know much behind the con artist who says that was her. Funny that ignorance can make you side with someone who shouldn't be worth defending, right? She's been accused of milking her harassment and attacks for publicity, but the gleeful irony of these criticisms is that they ignore the root of the problem, the fact that there were harassment and attacks for her to milk for publicity. If she didn't have a metric shit ton of hateful comments, spiteful Wikipedia edicts, and anti-Semitic slurs to work with, she wouldn't have been able to use them to get a leg up for her project. I find it funny that Jim basically confirms what I said about Anita being a professional victim. He says that people claim that Anita is a con for milking that publicity to make her money, yet also says that she wouldn't have had publicity if she supposedly didn't have anything to work with, despite evidence to prove that either she made her own harassing tweets for herself, or that she has other people to do it for her. Look at this video by the horse herself proving that. Virgin 2 is similar but takes it a step further. Anita, cre uh, sorry, Anita fakes the threats and harassment she receives on a regular basis, either by sending these threats to herself via sock puppet accounts, or by enlisting an army of feminists to do it for her. Where is that army? Seriously. She'd have produced her series, her existing audience would have watched it, likely agreed with her, and then... Nothing. Nothing. We wouldn't be talking about it right now. The woman you chose to make your mortal enemy would still be producing videos in her own little sector of the net, and video games would just be video gaming like usual. Let's keep in mind that Jim really thinks that Anita doesn't have the kind of influence to spread her toxic ideology in the game's media, in spite of how now it seems every game has to fulfill a diversity quota, lest they be labeled racist for it. 
I believe there is a notable quote of his that will shame him to this day. I keep getting linked to little editorials and videos exposing Anita Sarkeesian as this awful person. There was that game created allowing users to punch her in the face, and they're all coming from people who want her discredited and gone. Without those people slamming her and keep putting her in the public eye, she would have been gone. At least gone from the more public gamer spectacle. There's a bit of a war going on right now between those who want gender issues taken more seriously in gaming and those who are upset because they considered gaming a safe male space and are upset that them damn feminists are ruining everything. But again, I ask, what are they ruining exactly? What are a few debates about sexism going to ruin? Are they going to take away your dead or alive beach volleyball massive tit parade? Would that be a loss, even if they did? Which they won't, because so long as the market exists, publishers won't change shit. The worst that will happen is we'll have some interesting discussions, and some minds might be swayed. And if you don't want to be part of that debate, you know you don't have to be. They won't take Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball, you say. They won't take your video games away, you say. Hmm. Something tells me that not only will you regret saying that, but make passive-aggressive videos in future to debase it. Also, as for interesting conversations about feminism, in order for the conversation to be interesting, it has to have any kind of legitimacy, which feminism more than often does not. It's riddled with guilt by association, victim playing, sophistry of the likes. Feminism is a self-fulfilling ideology that relies on helpless women to keep its existence credible. Whether Anita really is an advocate for it, or is only writing on the ideology to make her money is up to debate. But I can most certainly say that feminism as a whole isn't a topic that is worth talking about in video games. But oh, the men are the ones wanting to save space, huh? A few people are now trying to retroactively justify the assault on her by accusing her of scamming and exploitation, but it's too late for that. If you'd have just let her make her fucking video in peace and rein in your knee-jerk viciousness, you might have been able to debate her on an intellectual playing field. You say that like as if the same people who lampoon the people making actual threats as part of the problem won't say that the criticisms are also misogynistic and that the people will even listen to the criticisms, of which there are many on her videos in particular. But all in all, she is no different than Jack Thompson in terms of her critique on her video games. But the difference is, she gets a pass because she's a woman and Jack Thompson is a white cis herald conservative male. Although, I will give credit where credit is due, Jim doesn't outright say that she could be right on her talking points because of said harassment, or at least he did at the time until him and the lowest point that was the AAA industry became an open wound for feminism's tendrils to infect it beyond 2013. After the Nita Sarkeesian video, Jim would denounce the very things he stood for back in 2011, starting with monster boobs and plastic children. Okay, seriously, I'm not one to make value judgments on the things people find erotic. Be ye furry, be ye a shoe fetishist, be ye someone who wants to fuck that. More power to ya. But if you get off on these things, these things bouncing right here, not actual breasts, but these freakish team ninja approximations, there's something wrong with you, because this isn't right. This is like, not human, or even of this earth. You, my friend, get hard or wet at the thought of unreality. We all know it, we all joke about it, but nobody seriously says it. Team Ninja, sort your fucking life out, mate. Your infantile idea of what boobs do is, frankly, pathetic. Now don't get me wrong, we've all tried masturbating over the dead or alive girls once, once, before we knew what real breasts were like, but never again, hardly ever. And I assume some people in Team Ninja have seen real breasts, so why? Why these things? Expressing his outrage at the thought of such gargantuan things would exist while trying to die it up as uncanny valley in spite of how normally proportioned they are to the rest of the body. Call this jiggle physics if you will, but this is a tendency not specific to the breasts. Look at all the weapons and hats in TF2 to have jiggle physics. A lot of those spurg out and move when there is no way for them to move. Also, the answer that Jim is looking for is sexual arousal, even if he thinks it's way too much, supposedly. But as a sleazy peddler of dead-eyed sex dolls with breasts that wobble about like two caravans in a hurricane. But you know, it's not really the massive busters that put a bad taste in my mouth. It's the recent justifications coming from the mouths of the creators of these wanton mutant tumours that really unsettle me. Because the waterbed boobs hanging off the chests of these things that look like plastic children? That's creepy enough. 
It doesn't need Team Ninja mouthpieces talking to make them even weirder. One of the worst examples have come from studio head Yasuki Hiyashi, who basically blamed the rest of the world for not being as cool with it as his friends. He said, For us, within our culture, we're showing women like that and we're trying to make them look attractive. We can't help it if other cultures in other countries around the globe think that it's a bad representation. Within our nationality and within our national borders, blah blah blah. He's basically saying, you know, Japan's cool with it, everybody else should be. Big fail from Hiyashi there. You see, Culture is no excuse. It's not a fucking excuse. In some cultures, they mutilate the genitals of females. And we're supposed to sit back and accept that just because it's culture? Ironic that he mentions patronizing in the context of Team Ninja's justification for it, when Jim himself will engage in patronizing behavior to those same fictitious girls on the screen. And I think culture does suit a worthy justification in the context of making your games based on that, because games are fictional don't actually hurt anyone, unlike said female genital mutilation, which if we are going to use the same culture argument, it's perfectly okay to do so in the US with males, but not okay for females for some reason. Japan has a pretty unusual emphasis on objectifying girls, which is not anything I have a problem with, but it really shouldn't be any surprise that a game cooked up like a satire of a beat-em-up sexualized to the nth degree would be made by a Japanese developer. Like, it wouldn't really be any surprise that a game that has a gun-toting, cigar-smoking badass who waves the stars and stripes in front of foreign countries could be made by an American. Although, of course, the opposite has occurred on both fronts. But have a far greater impetus to change. Because it's Marketing 101, guys. If you make a product for international distribution, you have to have a grasp of the reception your product will receive when it's distributed internationally. If Team Ninja made its games just for Japan, it'd be no less creepy, but it'd at least have a leg to stand on trying to justify itself. Making the game for worldwide launch invalidates the excuse that it's just their culture and the West is the one with the problem. You don't get to act innocent or shocked that people are criticising your decision to put monster boobs on teenagers when you decide to bring it across the borders. Yes, it's the responsibility of a game developer to change a game that other countries or other people find deplorable. It's not the responsibility of the people who find said game deplorable to fuck off on another game, and it's not their responsibility to let people do what the fuck they feel like it, so long as they don't actually hurt anybody. Nope, Team Ninja have to babysit moral crybabies over unrealistic representations of women, right Jimmy boy? I don't want to sound like I hate him either, but this moral outrage will get pettier and pettier as we go on. Continuing to wave his moral rule at other people is the aforementioned patronizing part of Jim's career, where he basically makes the argument that boof babes are basically the very definition of sexism in the beginning parts of this video. So I was going to brighten up the Jimquisition booth a bit by having some, some lovely ladies around in little skimpy thongs and bras and stuff, and then I found out it was sexist. Which isn't my fault. I, I don't have time to think about these things. I'm busy working out how to feed the poor and raise the debt ceiling and other important things. Putting women into binders. Well, pieces of them anyway. So luckily I found a good middle ground and I've brightened up the place with some other premium totty. My very own Booth Defoe. Isn't that right? I feel like a real pretty lady. Ah! A bit's full enough. Well, it is plasticine. Well, so much for guys just liking to see sexy girls, huh? I guess they're going to rape them and discredit their sovereignty as a human being if we see a little bit of skin, huh? Looks like guys are no more behaved than apes in prehistoric times whenever they see the boobs flopping around, in spite of how much these boob baits get paid for and how they are doing it for the express purpose of being ogled. But hey, whatever whets your moral whistle, right? And it don't get me wrong, I won't lie to you and pretend that if there's an attractive half-naked person, I'm not going to catch a sneaky glance. I will because I'm a monster. But then that's part of my personal problem with booth babes. Being near them makes me feel like the monster I evidently am, and I spend much of my time at E3 trying to keep away from them, out of fear that I might get caught standing next to one of them, and god, then people will think I'm trying to have sex with her, and then I'll be thrown out of E3 for being disgusting, and then my mum will know what a fucking piece of dirty shit I am, and oh fucking god, Christ in hell, don't get an erection. <laughs> I've um, got some social issues. Now, I will admit that my own discomfort is self-serving there. Hell, I'm a white man at a gaming convention. You don't get much more comfortable than that. Now, not everybody at E3 is a white man, and there are some female members of the press who aren't comfortable with booth babes at all, for many reasons. 
I'm just going to stop Jim short of here to note how this social justice mentality can seep into someone who is well-intentioned and doesn't seek to inflict harm upon others. He sees his natural curiosity and attraction to women as some kind of curse, some kind of omen to him that he can't possibly control, and he attributes his lack of control to him supposedly having backwards opinions of women, in spite of never having one, and now has to vindicate himself of that guilt by making others around him guilty of the same thing he thinks he is guilty of, in spite of it being artificially inserted in. In fact, I have often watched movies lately, or listened to music, with the idea of how would an SJW respond to this, and realizing that they would find any way to find a fault in it, regardless of how innocuous the fault. That very reductive mentality can destroy a person emotionally, where they can't find happiness in anything they do because they have to flog themselves with the mask first and repent for their sins before engaging in it, which sounds no fucking different from a religious cult, but of course, it's okay for the left to engage it, but not for the right. Of course, Jim says his own thoughts on this is self-serving, and he even dials it back a bit with this quip. When we say rah 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 ban booth babes, eliminate this despicable objectifying practice, I can't help but wonder if that's not a little dehumanizing itself, as we talk about booth babes as some alien entities and not as women doing jobs. We can't speak for these ladies, we can't say if they're being forced to do it if they hate it, and I certainly don't think we have a right to tell them they should stop. And when I hear tales of women being herded off to special areas, or being told by events staff to cover up, I feel kind of embarrassed for them. I mean, I, I'd find that embarrassing. And for all the attempts to look progressive, it really does shunt the burden of social dignity and dress code back onto the women, which doesn't feel fair. Now some would argue, yes, but nobody's saying the women have to stop doing it. No, you're not, but you are telling anybody who employs them to stop hiring them, so it kind of has the same end result, women out of work. Here's where I play coward and admit I don't have an answer for that. I kind of don't want to come down on one side because either way I'd feel like I'd be unfairly objectifying or idealizing a group of human beings. So yeah, Jim really does have the sense of being SJW like where he teeters and swings on their dick while also going for a more nuanced approach to the issue, if you can call it that. Personally, I don't give a shit. It might be distracting to some, but they are paid to do it, and some of them probably like the job, so it's safe to say we can't presume for them what's best for them, assuming you aren't trying to bring women down for the sake of their social class, like Anita would say. And speaking of fake nerd girls, it is our next entry on the Jimquisition cutting table, where Jim Sterling, to no direct number of people, talks down to them how they treat the fake gamer girls. Apparently, the new big controversy going around both gaming and wider geeky circles is the topic of so-called fake nerd girls. Hot girls that pretend to love video games or comic books or whatever, but they don't really. And some people, mostly real gamer boys, find this upsetting. Uh-huh. Okay, this is a thing, internet, again, really internet, this is what keeps some of you up at night, whether the girl with the Mario t-shirt really likes Mario, or is trying to get one over on you, fucking hell, how paranoid and weird can you get? It needs not repeating, of course, but I'm going to do it anyway, that the inherent prejudice of anybody who decries the fake gamer girl is inherently betrayed the moment someone utters the phrase fake gamer girl without a shred of irony and a ton of indignance. Let's face it, men don't come under that kind of ridiculous scrutiny. I've been called many things since I've been writing and talking about games for a living, but nobody's ID'd me to find out if I really do like games, or I'm just pretending to join an elite club that no less than 20 years ago, people were beaten up and laughed at for being a member of. Let's keep in mind that the only qualifications that a woman has to go through in order to be considered a gamer is based on superficial entities of such, whereas a man has to actually demonstrate the merits of their interests entirely. Similarly to the Booth Bathe video, a lot of these girls are only interested in the media because they can use their conventional attraction to put a magnet on themselves within it, and this is not me saying that it is inherently a problem, but to define them as faking it for attention doesn't seem entirely out of the ballpark. But instead of addressing that clear sexual dichotomy, Jim decides it's opportune to demonize a man for discrediting them when all they've done on their part is to wear a Mario t-shirt cut up around the chest. 
Also, for anyone wondering, there are in fact sexy women who do demonstrate their interest in games, like Olivia Munn or Sarah Jean Underwood, for instance. Yeah, keep your dicks in your pants, please. I don't know if these fake gamer girls exist in abundance, or even if they exist at all, but let's play devil's advocate and say there does exist a wide variety of these women, these hot women, who dress up as game characters or say they love Mass Effect explicitly for the purpose of getting your attention at gaming conventions. So fucking what? So what? How is that really negatively impacting your life at all? You know, at the time of this video I didn't really have an answer for that, at least until there were fake nerd girls of a more ideological interest that work underneath the twist games into their special ideological bubble. The superficial, big booby girls who play Twitch streams with the camera pointed down aren't doing any disservice for the game or didn't take any attention away from it. But the Brianna Woos and the Anita Sarkeesians of the world are intent on turning your games into their little Frankenstein monster without ever having to demonstrate they've even played the fucking things. Also, citation needed is going to be more prevalent throughout because Jim likes to mention that there's controversy about but never really aiming to point at the demographic of sorts and just generally thinks the broader public believes in it, which will be an ongoing fallacy of his later videos as we go on. This theoretical girl is not taking money out of your pocket, she's not informing game design, she didn't cancel your precious fucking Firefly, what is she doing so wrong that you care so much about? Is she taking male attention that you think you deserve? Are all these male writers decrying the fakery of nerdy girls just angry because they go to conventions dressed as Pikachu in a mini skirt and they're furious nobody's looking at them? That really is the only fucking reason I can think of that anybody would seriously have their day ruined by the existence of someone who maybe doesn't enjoy video games as much as they look like they do. Or Jim, as you described in your booth base vid, that it's distracting away from the actual game at hand because we wouldn't want to ogle the nerd girl, would we, right? Maybe lowering the standard is also a keen indication as to where this response comes from, not to say I personally care whether some faker wants to play a game, as long as it isn't for ideological purposes, but the standard for what constitutes a gamers comes from just having a conventional wisdom about what games are out today, which makes me, in spite of how often I do play video games, not a gamer. I've been too disillusioned and too jaded from the gaming industry to care about any games that have come out in the last three years or so, and all the games I play now are five years or older. So if you want to call me an ancient gamer, I guess that'd be more appropriate, but a modern gamer, I am not. But of course it seems to me more that, like the evangelical Christian who thinks atheists and Muslims spend every minute of their waking days dreaming of ways to re-kill Jesus, there's a bit of egotistical wish fulfillment going on, a secret desire for something masquerading as an overwrought grievance. Look, I understand. I'd love it if beautiful women dressed as video game characters were clamouring daily for my attention, but I'm a fat fucking charge with the sexual grace of a legless horse. Continuing to not demonstrate a particular demographic or number of people in mind, Jim makes the claim that none of these women who are faking their enjoyment out of gamers are doing it for the intention of other ugly men. Excuse me, Jim? Did you get miniature Alzheimer's and forget everything you said about the booth base vid? Aren't those women faking their enjoyment just to get ogled at too? I don't think the women who do this really care who is looking at them, just as long as they are being looked. But this video is already real with the presumption that a majority demographic holds a specific viewpoint. So let's sit down, take the bitter pill, and have a taste of what will be Jim's crowning achievement as the gaming white knight for feminism in accepting the isms. Gamers, for all their vocal righteousness, have a habit of trying to keep as many mouths shut as possible when it comes to discussing certain issues. Oh, they can talk for weeks over the ending to Mass Effect 3, or how furious they are that some people may dare enjoy the new Devil May Cry, but as soon as someone discusses potentially offensive content in a video game, it's a case of, why is this news? This isn't important. Stop talking about this immediately, please. I remember an article former Destructoid and current Penny Arcade writer Sophie Prell wrote about Skyrim, in which she studied potentially sexist content in the game. Now it was a reasonable article written by someone who actually enjoyed it, but because she dared use the term sexism next to the word Skyrim, she was accused of indoctrination, told to shut up, written off as ludicrous, all by people who clearly didn't read the article because they implied she was trying to take their Skyrim away from them. 
potentially sexist content, you say? Really, now? Because that doesn't sound like someone is reaching for the offense by trying to nitpick every little mistake a game has made, does it? But oh, of course, the feminists are the ones who have, have a valid point, and the gamers are the ones who sign objections to it. Just, uh, let me check in his channel real quick, and oh. Oh. That's right. Also, the article in question was by Destructoid, a magazine that Jim used to write for, so I could count out confirmation bias as one negative of this. But the article itself can't even describe one thing that is actually sexist about Skyrim! Go figure! She makes antidotes of how she was treated in the gaming sphere, and uses the racism narrative of the Nords and Dark Elves in Skyrim as a vessel to be a little victim, and that is the kind of person Jim is defending, folks. This happens every single time someone suggests a game isn't 100% inoffensive, and I can only assume the attempts to shut people down when they talk about this stuff stems from a fear that those people want to take your games away. Jack Thompson, Jim. Jack Thompson, a Florida attorney who was offended at Grand Theft Auto glorified violence and thought that it was a murder simulator and used his power and authority to try to ban it from retail sale. It failed, obviously, but if all it takes is one person getting offended by something, and that person being really powerful, then yes, Jim, they can take your games away by mere offensive fictional shit happening on the screen. Here's a refreshing thought for you. You can acknowledge games have potentially troubling, possibly offensive content in them, without having to outright condemn the game. Fact of the matter is that Skyrim does have sexist content in it. It does. One particular quest, which always leaves a bit of a sour taste, involves trying to humiliate and blackmail a woman for the crime of having too much sex. Don't worry, Jim. I'm sure that in a few years' time, no feminists will boycott GTA from targets based on presumed sexism, or Japanese game companies will be intimidated out from releasing their games to US shores for the same reason. Because in your world, any person who decries sexism of anything must be true, and must be valid. Also, as for that Skyrim quest, that black female was Saudia. Someone who was fleeing from the Alakir and needed to be a bit more promiscuous with the folks in order to get any help of leaving from isolation. But hey, when you take any value out of a woman, they are just a sex object you can mock with impunity, according to the writer in question. Boy, hasn't Anita's dirty clit wore off on you? We unfortunately live in a time of extremist opinions, where you've either got to blindly support video games completely, or consign them to damnation for eternity. In a way, I understand where some of the insecurity comes from. After years of mainstream media attacking games over trivial things and blaming them for stuff they couldn't have had a hand in, I can understand why criticism of games on a wider scale than simple reviews may touch a nerve. Well, I guess Jim isn't quite as stupid as we once thought, demonstrating how the gamer culture and gaming is used as a scapegoat for any stupid time talking point, such as with sexism, and yet doesn't see how Anita Sarkeesian is the leftist opposite of Jack Thompson who can actually get away with it because WOMAN! When a company puts a massive-breasted, dismembered torso in a collector's edition and calls it zombie bait, don't just shut your eyes, pretend you couldn't possibly see how that would be a problem for some people, and insult anybody who does have a problem with it. Come on, please, you're better than that. You don't have to find it offensive, you know. You don't have to not like the game. Nobody will take Dead Island Riptide away from you. Please, rest assured that the feminazis and the social justice cult won't flagrantly define anything going on in a game as sexist and then try to remove it. Please, Jim, when evidence of that shit actually comes out, ignore the fuck out of it and proceed to spin in our faces for it, too. Part of me is getting angry and is starting to see why Braggs and Sargon of Akkad dismiss him, in spite of what I do know of Jim Sterling. Now, before we delve into the next video that trapes some of the conventions of an SJW, there is a little thing called GDC 2013 we have to mention. What is that, or what that has to do with Jim Sterling, you ask? Well, GDC is an annual gaming convention where notable people in the gaming industry and people who have talked at great length of it, Jim included, come to talk to the public a bit more personally. And here, one Adam Sessler was for doxing those he deemed assholes. And how did Jim respond? Well, here's a quick for you. Deflated and defeated. Uh, it, it really, and, and it, don't even give me that First Amendment nonsense. You have every right to say it, and I have every right to call you a fucking asshole and try to find your address yes. and put it out there! Now, granted, I have no evidence of Jim actually doxing any one of those, or so to speak, assholes, so his definition of asshole is different from Sessler's. But if his cronies are doing it, you can guarantee he's going to look the other way around and not mind it a bit. 
GDC 2013 happened around late March of 2013, so you get an idea of where we are chronologically in Jim's world. And we come right up at the span of April the 1st with the creepy cold female protagonist, which really starts to make you think it's a fucking joke. In a recent interview with Penny Arcade Report, Remember Me's creative director revealed he had to fight tooth and nail to make a game with a female protagonist. According to him, he was told straight up that you can't have a female character in games, it has to be a male character character, simple as that. The game industry doesn't want female protagonists. Even worse, the game industry doesn't want playable female characters that exist as human beings. Remember Me wanted to give its heroine an actual life, involving a relationship with a man, and was told, disturbingly, you can't make a dude like the player kiss another dude in the game. That's going to feel awkward. Mm. I've not considered that before, but as I thought more about it, I realised we really don't see a whole lot of women allowed to have any agency in physical contact. I can't think of many playable female protagonists who are actually seen initiating intimacy in any real way. So Jim, the man who has critiqued the gaming industry upon a countless number of times, who has no reason to believe anything that a game publisher says as they are out of touch and all in it for the money, for some reason, decides to forego his incredulity to the specific topic at hand. It sounds like to me that Jim wants this mentality to exist so he has another opportunity to shame the gamers for wanting to ogle women, in spite of the fact that what a publisher says has never been true about the gamers. These are the same publishers, mind you, that Jim denounces for saying that horror games don't sell anymore, that strategy games don't sell anymore, and that puzzle games don't sell anymore, and decide to streamline and multiply the same copy-paste brown shooter or everything sandbox, but is perfectly okay with taking the publisher's word for it when it's convenient to throw the gamers under the bus again. I don't even think Jim is aware that he is morally gaslighting the gamers by doing this instead of critiquing the games industry for how out of their league they are. The general idea is that women can be sexy, women can be hot, they can have their massive boobs bounce up and down, parade around in bikinis or chainmail lingerie for your sexual enjoyment. The male audience can drool all over them, but the moment a female heroine initiates, reciprocates, or otherwise has any involvement outside of being a piece of alienated sex meat, things get awkward and undesirable. Admit it or not, but that's the very essence of objectification. The idea you can't play a woman in a straight relationship lest it incur the insecure homophobic wrath of the audience is disturbing in its reduction of a female character to a mere ornament. And as I demonstrated earlier, something that a publisher has said is now at the behest of the audience who supposedly don't want to play as a female character, in spite of many popular games, that still hold the zeitgeist of iconic video games having a female character. Metroid, Tomb Raider, Ms. Pac-Man, Mario to extent. All of these games had a prominent female character in them with a dominant male audience who still play the game in spite of it, so to me, being the guy who's on the outside looking in, gamers don't give a shit about what gender they're playing as, so long as it's fun. We recently saw Elizabeth relegated to the back cover of Bioshock Infinite, and as someone who has played the game, I can tell you what a crime that is for the character, to not acknowledge her as THE star of the game. She's a fantastic character, a brilliant one, and Bioshock Infinite is absolutely HER game. But you'd never know that looking at the box. There's a saying that goes, you can't judge a book by its cover, and sure, Elizabeth is a major character in the game, and she is in the back cover, but she isn't the player character of the game like Booger DeWitt is. And even in spite of all that, Anita still considers Elizabeth a horrible female character because of arbitrary rules that are scribbled and snuffed down in convenience of a narrative. Going back to Metroid, the game is called Metroid for the little brain-shaped bug things that take some narrative hold in the game, but by Jim's definition, do you want to know that because Samus and Ron is on the fucking cover of it? Weird, isn't it? That game covers usually have the player character at the front, no matter what? Maybe, I don't know, it's to give people the idea of who they are playing as, and granted, not for all covers, but that just might be the reason Booker is on the front cover of Bioshock Infinite. <sighs> Occam's Razor is a good deterrent to conspiracy. Now, director Ken Levine's defended this, and I do absolutely get his argument. He said the art was focus-tested, that people were most attracted to Booker DeWitt stood alone, being a gun bro, like all the other box art with all the other gun bros. And Levine wants Infinite to have the best shot at success, and do well, and sell to everyone. So, let's agree for the sake of it that this art is Infinite's best shot at success. Agreeing with that, can we at least 
also agree it's fucking sad as fuck that this is Infinite's best shot. To hide the woman folk lest they scare away the audience. Focus tested, Jim. The very same thing you decry of the game industry for saying that horror puzzle strategy games don't sell because of focus testing. But hey, it's fine to paint a broad brush at the gamers for no apparent reason, or to let the cynical sludge of the gaming industry have its coals if it's in the defense of Madame, right? And Jim waxes on about how he's fine with believing the publisher's tale of it if it's to defend the woman, while again trying to make it seem like he's level-headed and nuanced about the issue when he's so desperate to make video gaming a gendered issue somehow. People have their niches, and biology makes some of those niches. Damned if you do, damned if you don't appeal to women, Jim. But Jim just couldn't stop himself short being joined at the hip of an E.S. Arkeesian by making the men are too but argument in his objectification and men video. Common argument I typically see in any discussion of sexism in gaming is the point that objectification of women isn't a unique problem worthy of discussion because men are just as objectified. We're all equally reduced to lusted meat, goes the suggestion, therefore we need to stop talking about women's problems. According to the argument. While women are portrayed as having tiny waists, big breasts, and thrusting their asses in every direction, the men are overly muscled, overly brave, and overly powerful. This uh, neo-gaff response to my Jimquisition on Dragon's Crown put the argument as such, stating that male leads in games are ripped tall and heroic, and he's not upset by it, so why the big stink over women being portrayed uniformly as walking boob dispensers? You know, I don't think wanting to believe we're all equal, I don't think wanting to believe that the playing field is level makes you an ignoble person. Hell, it'd be nice to believe that. It's not, however, true. And it's not true that men in gaming are really objectified. They're not. He says this with confidence despite how your typical male gamer isn't, well, six feet tall, handsome, or brave per se, and that the kinds of men that women ogle over are exactly that the ideal man for a given situation, just as a man sees big breasts, a tiny waist, and large thighs as their ideal woman. This is also contrary, again, to his second video in the series where he demonstrates that women objectify men in the same fashion, but what they objectify is different to what men do, and by that metric of his, he can say that the men doing it are bad for it. First of all, let's examine who games are being made for. Despite the gaming audience being roughly half women, most AAA games are still made entirely with young men in mind. That's not an assumption. Ken Levine himself admits Bioshock Infinite was marketed to appeal to frat boys, Naughty Dog has revealed its focus testers didn't want to see what women thought of The Last of Us and was trying to appeal exclusively to males, while the director of Remember Me has told her female protagonists are being killed off by publishers because men allegedly don't want to play as a girly girl. We know that mainstream games Game development is predominantly designed by men for men, and knowing that, we have to ask exactly who is this hypothetical male objectification being done for? Not only does he once again bring up the fallacious argument that a supposed publisher said in the Creepy Cold video that, given his track record of distrusting them, shouldn't have any right to believe, but also that's the fallacious women make up 50% of the industry argument when that 50% comes to mobile games of which you only have to delve minutes at a time or in console or PC games where hours are needed to be wasted to get fulfillment. As for Naughty Dog having to fight to get Ellie on the box art, it actually just came down to the discussion on it and not a gavel-wielding judge, as Jim would like to presume. Because the industry has a practiced history of not giving a fuck about women. Gay men? Ha! <laughs> We've not even moved past the lol you wanna have sex with a man lol gay stage of video game writing yet, if only. No, in the same way female characters are being designed to appeal to men, so too are male characters. But not, of course, in the objectifying sense. Objectification is the reduction of a human being to a thing, an item, a something to possess. This is what's meant when we say women are objectified. In a previous video I explained how video games typically objectify women, by making them the targets of sexual desire while stripping them of their agency and sex. Women are allowed to dress skimpily, they're allowed to be hit on, and they're allowed to be fucked. However, they're not allowed to initiate sexual contact, be playable during a sex scene, or really have any input in a relationship outside of being an objective, a goal, a 
thing for the male hero to go after. This is not what happens with male characters. They're presented as tall, muscular, heroic, and brave, and most importantly, they're not supposed to be things we want to own. They're not targets. They're not goals. Their ideals are our goals, but they themselves as individuals are not. And that's what men are in the game industry. Not objectified, but idealized. I might as well have to bring this up considering that the next video after this one is one of my most favorite of Jim's horrible arguments, but idealization and objectification go hand in hand. Men want to be Dante or Kratos, and they want to save women like Beatrice and Aphrodite, and women want to be the saved and want to be saved by those very same men. The sexual dimorphism at its finest, not rooted in culture or video games of all things, but by pure biological input that is leagues older than any feminist ideology to exist. If Jim is seriously going to tell me that the same kinds of man that million male gamers idealize over are also not objectified by the females, then it is as much of a slippery slope as his presumption that male gamers can't see themselves play a female in a relationship. Women are objectified, they're supposed to be things men want. Men are idealized, they are heroes men are supposed to want to be. Now frankly, I think this uniform idealization of what men ought to be is a problem in and of itself, but it's not the same problem faced by women. It's a different problem and it's not equal, especially when the idealization involves traits that are generally considered pretty good to have. Physical strength, nobility, bravery, I mean, I'd rather have those traits than have no personality or life outside me tits and vulva. Hell, playable female characters get objectified and idealized. When it comes to male protagonists, you can have ugly, grizzled, or old characters. Your Marcus Phoenixes, your old snakes. You can have a male hero that doesn't conform to the archetypal template of physical beauty. Not so with a leading lady. Even the best playable female characters are going to be inoffensively beautiful in some way, shape, or form, held on a pedestal to represent what a good girl should be. There's a bit more leeway with supporting characters but not much, and very rarely. Wow, it's like as if Jim read the fire scripts of some of the Nia Sarkeesian's handiwork almost. It's like as if, believe it or not, women aren't predominantly a part of the gaming culture and only hold so much sway in the tablet and phone apps department because it's likely not in their best interest to play a game for four and a half hours in one go. And because of that, the playable female characters that Jim hates for being objectified, because now it's bad apparently, are like that because they're still being played by a majority male demographic. Imagine my fucking surprise when a media like romance novels that is dominated by a female demographic has men depicted and objectified in the very same way they are idealized in video games by male gamers. It's like there's some sort of biological trend in fact, a necessity to behold. But it's only bad when the males do it, according to Jim. It sounds good to say we're all equally objectified. It sounds inclusive. It is, as I say, untrue. And only serves to obscure the actual problems with both female and male video game characters. So basically what Jim is saying is that no matter how hard you try to be inclusive, as he's gone in prior videos, there will never be enough for the feminist cult to inject your games with their toxic rhetoric, and that they will never be satisfied. It's like I'm experiencing deja vu or something, and I'm sure I'm doing a Jim Sterling analyst video or a Nita Sarkeesian one. So if that wasn't enough for you to unsubscribe, dislike, and leave a nasty comment on every one of Jim Sterling's videos, if it wasn't enough that your hobby was being tainted by someone who presumes to have your best interests in mind while stabbing you in the back with false assumptions about what you think of women, according to Jim, no strong female character has ever existed past the 1990s, if this video is anything to go by. So let me paint the scenario for you. First, make a female character, then define with an unsightly high standard for what constitutes a strong female character, then proceed to shit. Shit hard on every single female character that has ever existed until you find one that you can say truly fits your weird demands from an obscure game that I'm sure couldn't be sexualized in any fashion because Rule 34 apparently doesn't exist. That is the basis for my favorite argument from Jim, which I will call the Vertigo Fallacy. Take it away, Jim. 
I don't think it should be controversial to point out that men have way more opportunities as characters in video games than women do. Men are allowed to be morally questionable or downright villainous like Kane and Lynch, the other Kane, and every Grand Theft Auto protagonist. When it comes to playable anti-heroes, only bad boys are allowed, you don't get to play as a bad girl. Similarly, men are allowed more freedom in the aesthetics department. You can play as an old man like Old Snake in MGS4, or this old fuck from Heavy Rain. Male protagonists can even be ugly, or at least traditionally not attractive. We've a meaty Marcus Phoenix, a malformed Wario, or grizzled plain chain John Marston. By contrast, playable women are almost universally designed to be young and attractive. Lara Croft, Jill Valentine, even the regular go-tos that gamers always try out to prove everything's okay, Jade and Samus, are on the objectively unquestionable end of the attractive spectrum. I've seen the same poor argument from before, but also that I mean the nothing is ever good enough to Sterling Jim the Winker, or SGW for sort. As I said before, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So why try to cater to a public that won't even play your games, much less be satisfied if you cater to them? I've scoured the video game industry to find a playable woman who bucks the trends, and I've applied various rules to get there. Firstly, I excluded characters you create yourselves, as they're not generally originally written characters. They're designed to represent you, the player, and your goals. They're kind of your avatar more than anybody else. The first horrible standard of the Vertigo fallacy that Jim represents is of erasing all the RPGs and create your own characters in video games, despite that you can realistically make your ideal female character by his own metric because, well, it's you. Guess what, Jim? The character players that actually exist are also vessels for the player to put in their shoes, so don't give me that crap that RPGs are the sole progenitor of it. Second, the character needs to not be conventionally attractive. There's nothing wrong with that, but we've got hundreds of that already. We're looking for someone who isn't all boobs and assholes, someone not designed with sexing up in mind. The second standard assumes that doing this will therefore not make the character sexualized in any way by the players, which is also false when you consider Rule 34, as well as the number of even conventionally attractive female characters being drawn and looted in a way not intended. In Dark Souls, for instance, I couldn't tell you enough times how people would loot half-breed Priscilla or the Emerald Herald in spite of them not being conventionally attractive per se, or hell, the fucking monsters in the game like the Pasaka or the Mushrooms for god's sakes. And of course, you got your Guinevere's or anyone wearing the Desert Sorcerer's set, but what I'm saying, trying to say, is that nothing is sacred. Thirdly, we want a character with unique motivations beyond just surviving some terrible hardship or doing something for a man. That's another issue with women in games and actually a lot of fiction. Women can't be heroic without suffering some trauma, being a love interest or being inspired by an awesome kick-ass man in some way. And you know, it would be nice to have someone with some personality, not some conventional goody-goody doing generic heroics like a generic hero. And the third standard, well, shit, where do I even start? So to speak, the male characters that Jim watches over being allowed to be grizzled have traumatic past that motivate some of their decisions, like Marcus Phoenix being a prisoner for his insubordination during an E-Day, or of his friend sacrificing himself to save him when he was when he has nothing to lose. And Jim basically damns the concept of even being central to the story as a protagonist like Anita does, because how dare we forsake women for something as fundamental to storytelling, right? Just make a non-entity like Rey is in the Star Wars series, with no motivation or clear goal in mind other than to marry Sue up the series. We're looking for a playable, developer-created protagonist who is not sexy or traditionally hot, with unique personal motivations that don't fall into the usual stereotypes, is not reliant on men in some trite way, and is, you know, original and creative. And obviously we want her to be able to enjoy the same sense of power and strength that male protagonists enjoy. That would be nice. It's an optional extra, I'd say. So after roaming the land, consulting with wise counsellors and lighting candles in the temples of enlightened gods, I have found video game history's most individual, unique, and interesting woman character. And there's the punchline, folks. A weird dinosaur thing from an obscure brawler that only has a write-off description of her biography, because that's about as much depth as you can give to a character in a genre such as that. Also, let's keep in mind that Vertigo is in a game where you have gorillas and dinosaurs fight, so you can actually get away with not needing to sexualize a thing, since they're depicted as animals and not humans. And that, of course, obviously, Vertigo can and will be sexualized no matter how you depict it. 
the fucking memes aren't safe from it, then neither are your obscure brawlers as a means to act like a moral authoritarian against the gaming industry. This, this big walking snake from 1994, is the most notable female protagonist you have, game industry. Just think about that. Seriously think about it. This is really one of the best you've ever managed to do, damn near 20 years ago. Very much in the same way that Nia's only two positive female characters that she mentions are basically non-entities, or are only tangentially known as female, like Shell or the Scythian, Jim doesn't seem to realize that characters like Vertigo aren't being made, is because they aren't interesting, or write-offs, and exist in limited fashion, because brawlers don't really take time to delve into a character's story arc, especially if this one came out in 1994. As a result, the Vertigo fallacy is something that I will always bring up, when some moral busybody is trying to find their version of a ideal female character. Your ideal female character isn't everybody else's ideal female character, and their ideal female character isn't sexist because it isn't your ideal character. Getting into the middle of June of 2014, which is yet another important date to keep in mind with a certain gate of gamers hashtag, Jim decides again to dip his toes into SJW territory, and it's the first time in this series of videos I've discussed where Jim actually mentions the pejorative term. Two years ago, two years ago, I covered the ridiculous default status of generic white male as the video game protagonist. Uh, and yet here we are in 2014, with Ubisoft not only clinging to what is rapidly becoming a dated ideal, but defending it with frankly pathetic excuses. First up, we have Assassin's Creed Unity, named so because its four co-op protagonists are apparently exactly the fucking same. Four hooded dudes, not a woman or really anybody different among them, which looks conspicuous by itself. When called out on this, Ubi's excuse was a lack of resources. The devs said they had playable women listed as a feature to begin with, but scrapped it because they'd have to redo a lot of animation and get a woman voice actor, claiming it was an unfortunate reality of game development that Assassin's Creed, one of the biggest money-making franchises in the game world, cannot do what Bioware, Blizzard, fucking Dynasty Warriors is a mega force, and Zombie Studios can do. I guess I've had, in fact, missed several other videos where you condemns games for having the same straight white male protagonist, not because it's typical and cliche, but because of ism. Sorry if I can't cover, cover nearly 400 gemquisitions in a single video, folks. Anyway, so the argument is, is that it's based on resources which seems reasonable given that you literally have to double the animation and voice acting costs, and don't give me this bull that they could just copy paste the male animations into the female animations. And Jim sees that as a poor excuse for diversity. My question then becomes, why have diversity for diversity's sake? That's exactly why so many people were turned off when Ubisoft summarily did it with the Assassin's Creed Syndicate, cynically shoving in a female protagonist and a transgender person just for the sake of meeting a quota and not by having a creative vision. It seems that Jim himself is less about wanting developers to see their vision of a game come to life and instead demand that they carry to Jim's version of a game as demonstrated here, and it was this very stupid argument that made Ubisoft just cynically shove in diversity to get out of bad publicity. Two years ago, on this very show, I shared that bit of developer insight, and still developers are clinging to an excuse that, I'll say it plainly, is not fucking correct. Zombie also said that the growing amount of women playing games makes any cost worth it. I find it hilarious that this game industry is obsessed with expanding its audience, with appealing to a wider number of people, they say it all the fucking time, and yet that always translates to them just wanting more young white men and boys. You know, maybe if games worked harder to appeal, to some other human fucking beings, they'd get the audience expansion they so desperately crave. Some gamers love to use the libertarian philosophy to justify these decisions. They say, let the market decide if it wants women characters, which could be a fair retort if game companies actually were letting the market decide. Companies like Ubisoft aren't even giving the market a chance to vote with its wallet. Other companies, if they do have female protagonists, well, it's said that they put like 50% of the marketing budget behind it that they'd put behind a different game. So. We'll We'll never know if more people would buy Assassin's Creed Unity if it were more representative because Ubi isn't being more representative in the first place. Again, Jim is not an advocate for letting the devs decide how to make their games, but a sprinkle of patronizing to the gaming audience like as if the only reason women and black people don't play these games is because they aren't represented in any fashion because god forbid you can identify or sympathize with someone beyond that, right? 
And with that out of the way is the rise of the Gamergate hashtag as a result of the Zopos and the, of the social justice mob road and game journalism coming to Madame's defense, lest they be castigated as the scummy fucks they truly are. It was at this point that I was quite well fed up with social justice and started to make poetry of my own against it, starting with quintuple as the catalyst for so many poems to come. These game journals had the tenacity and the gall to call the gaming medium dead and to say that they don't have to cater to you all in the name of someone who made a glorified Facebook survey post because she sucked Nathan Grayson's dick to completion, which makes it doubly ironic considering that Jim had co has covered several of his articles as a linchpin for his Jim position videos. And what exactly did Jim have to say about that? Did he stand up for the convictions of the community he apparently cares for and support ethics and journalism? Or did he result to the same tacit labels that these game journals plug into their audience and make them feel guilty? Neither. Fucking neither. He stood on the fence and kept his fucking mouth shut the entire way. Now, I would normally be fine with this if you are ignorant of the events unfolding. But when it comes to Jim Sterling, someone who is constantly active on a GAMING JOURNALISM WEBSITE, I find it appalling that he had nothing to say about it either way. Maybe it was indifference, or ignorance. But ignorance, as we've seen before, can make you in misinterpret something entirely. As Gamergate became the new boogeyman scapegoat for the PC police to toss around, Jim was still coupling up with the pejorative in this video where he believes he hasn't touted SJW talking points. Social justice warrior is a term that may at one point have been meant to insult radical individuals, but it's become so abused and exploited it doesn't really get to mean much anymore. It's become a catch-all term for person I disagree with. I've been called an SJW quite a bit lately because I've argued that it's a good idea, business-wise as well as socially, for games to be more inclusive. I've always tried to argue these points rationally and calmly, and when it comes to issues of gender, race, and sexuality, I'm pretty fucking lukewarm by design. I'm not always successful in that endeavour, sometimes I get a bit overbearing with all sorts of topics, sure, but I try not to be. Nevertheless, here I am on a list of SJWs that you must avoid at all costs for having what are really quite moderate views. Notice on that last image off the clip that the other person on the SJW list beside Jim on the escape is none other than Bob No Bad Tactics Only Bad Targets Chipman, who unlike Jim, made a huge shit fit over the whole Gamergate controversy, believing that Zoe Quinn was an innocent girl who got mauled by gaming's hatred of women, and not a professional victim caught red-handed in the cookie jar. That alone caused Bob's departure, but as for Jim, I am not certain of his reasons for leaving the escape as far from wanting to venture to YouTube as he became a big enough entity to do so, so I'll take it as that being the reason. As for the video, I have demonstrated in great length, and what great length this video is, how Jim does hold SJW tendencies, and that it isn't just something people label on someone they disagree with. Not it can't be, but for Jim, he holds a unique distinction of what I've already called a SJW light. I'm reminded of how many people attack me for being a fan of Anita Sarkeesian because I said she doesn't deserve to be harassed and that her fame is a direct result of people who hate her bringing her up all the time. People hate that I'm such a fan of feminist frequency, except I'm not a fan of feminist frequency. See, and I'm gonna peel back the veneer here, you can say someone doesn't deserve harassment and not even like their work. I don't really watch Anita's videos, I don't find her style all that compelling, and just I determined the show wasn't for me. Now, I think she has a right to make the videos without being threatened and attacked, and apparently that's translated by some as me saying Anita's fantastic and can do no wrong. No. I think the thing that most people are misinterpreting with Jim when it came to his defense of Anita had more to do with legitimizing the obviously fake harassment that she got in order to proper Kickstarter and herself as a victim. I obviously took as him showing incredulity to the events unfolding and him just believing that the harassment must be true. But I think another thing that Jim kind of implied in his defense of Anita was that she was right because of the harassment she got, which couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I'm one of the middle ground guys, it should be fairly obvious by now that my views do lean on the left side of the central divide, even though I consider myself fairly centrist politically. I don't hide that. I think feminism is generally a good fucking thing that benefits women and men, and I think diversity is absolutely brilliant for games from a business, creative, and just generally nice perspective. 
Don't you worry, Jim. Those same feminists that you think are out to help you will always tell you that, in spite of your allyhood, that you are still a white cis male that has benefiting from the patriarchy. Also remember, folks, diversity, no matter what reason, is always good for business, like it was for Acid Creed Syndicate and for Mass Effect Andromeda. Not diversity of your creative intuition, not diversity of thought, nope, diversity of skin color and sex. Because when I play a game as a female or an Asian person or a fucking animal, I can't sympathize or understand them in any capacity because I'm a white male. To Jim, we're all tribalistic, race puritans who see people as the descriptors they are before they are a fucking human being, while also claiming that other people are those very things. Now here are my allegedly warlike beliefs, and if they're too extreme for you, then bye. Bye bye. Video games are big enough for us all. Harassment is shitty. Making everyone feel welcome is a nice thing to do. Except that they are being quote unquote assholes, then you have every right to show their personal address, phone number, social security number, age, who they're fucking, their parents' middle name, the works. And if Madame is being swept away by the tide of harassing tweets she makes herself, it's also fine to throw gamers under the bus for it, as well as throwing them under the bus for shit they have no control over, or any oversight over by a monolith of out-of-touch cynical sludge that is the AAA industry. I really wish I could believe you, Jim, when you say this, but I think you have just a smudge of bias. I think we've come nearly full circle of Jim's second ever Jimquisition in this video in particular, knowing the transformation of someone who saw sex as innocuous and wholesome for both parties involved now sees it as a problem, where he herald Bayonetta as someone who uses her sexuality and empowered themselves in the 2011 video, now god forbid any woman wants to be a bit sexually promiscuous, and god forbid any man find any sexual attraction to any woman at all. Given that, Bayonetta was created by a woman who thought it was cool that Bayonetta would use her sexuality to fight the bad guys. You think that Jim, a flagrant supporter defending Madame, no matter what, but of course, it wasn't really about the rights of women or inclusivity or what have you. It was for the ideology, as Ania said after the fact. And even then, she said that feminism isn't about free choice, but the collective rights of women as a social class, which doesn't sound overtly collectivist, I'm sure. Guys, guys, come here. Okay, shh. Got a bit of a secret tip for you, okay? When you're on Twitter or Facebook or a message board or whatever, and you type the sentence, death threats against, female game developer name here, are deplorable and horrible and cannot be condoned. However, stop there, okay? Just, just stop there, remove the however, stick with the period, and just leave it as is. Uh, the world doesn't need another implied condoning of harassment under the guise of not condoning it. Uh, just a little bit of a secret tip from me to you to uh, enrich your conduct on this here internet. Who says I'm not looking out for ya? Now, it seems that Jim wants to divulge in different subjects before getting into the meat of the video, which of course gives him an opportunity to make it seem like as if gamers are the only ones who send harassment to only female game developers. If you can call Zoe Quinn a game developer per se, and I know that Aenea Sarkeesian isn't damn well one, and Brianna Wu, well, is proving that she sent herself harassment by typing it in as a different alias, but not realizing that her status on her own page was that of the manager. Also, Remember, Jim, you advocated for doxing of assholes, so if they are being an asshole, then we should have free reign to reveal information about them, right? Not to say any of these gamers revealed any precious details other than their plain hypocrisy, and you know a lot about plain hypocrisy, right? Bayonetta is one of the more fascinating case studies when it comes to the portrayal of women in games. A polarizing figure, there are some who view her as a symbol of empowerment, and others who see her as little more than wish fulfillment for men. This discussion happens amongst feminist gamers too, as people debate whether or not she's a good or bad example of a woman protagonist. Yes, sometimes even feminists disagree, and no, they don't threaten to come to each other's houses to do a murder. Feminist gamers? Ha! <laughs> don't make me laugh. And they don't threaten to murder people at their own homes, huh? I wonder, Jim, who was the one that coined the term dice is scum? Who was the one that ironically wanted to kill all men? Who was the one who took joy in drinking the tears of men, you say? Don't feminists charge in on other people's protests to tell them how much of a piece of shit they are? Or try to shut the event down because feminists are so dogmatic in this false notion that they're on the right side of history? I think feminists not being able to agree on a single goddamn thing is one problem because it just shows that feminism is a self-fulfilling ideology. It doesn't work to help out a group of people, only the person telling you to believe. It's in Aenea's best interest to turn women characters into basically clean and empty slates and for literally 
no one else. Though I also fully recognise that yes, the crotch and ass shots are clearly designed for the male gaze. The most important thing for me is that Bayonetta has agency. Her innuendo-laden speech and seductive mannerisms are represented as being her choice. In an industry where women are often portrayed as goals to be attained, where a woman's sexuality is a reaction to a man's input, I can appreciate the positives of Bayonetta as a character who embraces smut without provocation. She is sexual, obviously, but I never get the sense she's had sexualization transposed onto her creepily, like she's some sort of boner mannequin. A lot of scantily clad women in games often have very little personality to speak of. You know, like, I'm not a fan of games. I don't, like, ugh, take joy in blowing out the heads of people. It's just, like, gross. Sounds like we got someone who doesn't personally like something trying to inject their personal disgust of it in a medium again. As for the low-hanging fruit that is Dead or Alive games, is that really the hill the feminists want to die on for? That obvious crawl up of horny kicks? It's not like the DOA games are even that popular compared to other bearer selling games, which is primarily why all the controversy involved with it just seems petty when it's clearly meant as titillation for a male audience that still dominates the gaming industry in spite of the falsehoods thrown at you. Bayonetta has a personality, agency, a clear level of power and control over her world, and that's why I think she's brilliant. I'm also a believer in refuge in audacity, and that something suitably outrageous can at times justify potentially offensive material. Material. Bayonetta isn't just ridiculous, it's committed to its ridiculousness. It's so extreme in its over-the-top nature, I find it hard to take anything it does seriously or personally. You can summon giant toads made out of hair. I mean, that says plenty. All that said, however, it's perfectly valid to argue in the other direction, for indeed we can't deny those infamous crotch shots are there for the saucy enjoyment of the player. We can't deny that her limbtastic design and a back arched so painfully as to qualify for emergency medical treatment could be viewed as approaching 1990s levels of crazy. And as I've argued in the past, it's perfectly okay to recognise these issues as potential concerns, to even admit they may be a problem, and still enjoy the game and character for what they are. Jeez, Jim. In spite of you not even watching any of his videos, you do really hearken to some of her flawed arguments. For one, if you didn't have a fucking problem with it, Jimmy boy, you wouldn't have brought it up to begin with. And if Bayonetta is completely outrageous in his portrayal of sexuality, aren't her ballerina moves and crotch shots just indicative of that? Why do you feign those just as substandard titillation? Also, Jim, here's a surprise for you. Bayonetta isn't really my thing. I know, weird, being a straight white man, it's like I have my taste elsewhere. And as I demonstrated in that aforementioned video, it's only a matter of time when the subject of sexuality being depicted is taken as malicious and hurtful to women, and that it needs to be shut down, as we will see shortly soon. If you think we ha have to take the isms, then you aren't really acknowledging that it's something worthy of discussion, you're saying that it's morally objectionable, and that games should strive for sex-negative games from the looks of it. Your prior videos seem to favor that mentality of spite of you apparently never watching a femme freak video. I recognize, for example, there's a lot of gratuitous ass shots in Lollipop Chainsaw, and it's one of my favorite games. I recognize that Grand Theft Auto has a troubling history with representing women in its games, and I can still love the series. Huh, Jim, what was that about creative freedom should be put into the hands of the developer, you say? I couldn't hear that with the sound of you saying we need to put a woman because diversity in GTA 5. Keep in mind as well that you play as three characters all at once, so this idea that we need to have female representation is thrown out the window when you consider that anyone, boy or girl, can and will sympathize with the characters, like how I sympathize with Franklin the most in spite of him being black. I know, it's crazy, it's like... Ham-fisting diversity in the game actually doesn't do anything for the game and makes you have a low opinion of a gender or race when you do so. God damn! It's okay to like Bayonetta as a character. It's okay to not like Bayonetta as a character. This recent anger at Polygon for daring to give Bayonetta the not really that low score of 7.5 in part because the reviewer was uncomfortable is just a shame. Well, let's see, Jim. Didn't Polygon also give Dragon's Crown a 6 out of 10 for the same retarded ass reason? Shouldn't game journals have some amount of knowledge to understand the context of a game, or let's not put their own personal offense of a game as a rain into it, so as to not make the reviews seem terror to bias? And while Polygon is cancerous for game journalism, people still check them out to get an impression of the games that have come out. And don't you think them rating it a 7 out of 10 because some sex native smear was offended at Bayonetta was so gratuitous in her sexuality is going to negatively affect the impression that the audience has going into it? 
This is what I'm talking about before when trying to implant bad motives out of people with none. That because a game is made in a certain way that somehow that will make gamers think less of somebody or something when all in all it didn't affect them at all. But you know a lot about injecting your own personal bias into a game, right? You wouldn't, oh, I don't know, mock the very notion of having an objective review by literally having a 100% objective review, right? And with that in mind comes the very last Jimquisition on the Escapist podcast, signed November 10th, 2014, nearly three years after the sexism situation video, in which Jason Schreier, ironically both a game journal and a massive white knight for the Aeneas Arkeesians of the world, made an ass out of himself by saying that objectivity is a silly thing to strive for in the context of writing a game review. Rightfully, gamers were upset that he would say something like this because basically it's a write-off for him and other journalists to wax stale about the patriarchy and the most innocuous shit in games rather than talking about the fundamental mechanics of it. And Jim, in his infinite wisdom, saw this as gamers wanting literally 100% objectivity in games, which couldn't be farther from the truth. So what does he do? He does a review of Final Fantasy XIII doing just that. Final Fantasy XIII is a video game released on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. It was developed by Square Enix. It stars characters. One of the characters is called Lightning, and that is the main character of the game that can be played with a controller. The game's story is about Lightning and a collection of other characters who must fight some other characters called Falsi and save a planet called Cocoon. The story has a beginning and an ending and a middle bit. Jim, the guy who looks at both sides of the issue, who apparently respects the mass audience of gamers' opinions when it comes to subjects that they've enjoyed, lets this topic of objectivity go so over his head as to make an ass out of himself for doing so. Here's a little secret, Jim. Yes. Gamers understand you cannot be 100% objective, but not being able to be 100% uh, objective does not give you free reign to be 100% subjective. What gamers are asking for is that you take as much of uh, your personal bias out of a game as inhumanly possible so that gamers aren't tricked into thinking that, oh, I don't know, The Witcher 3 is racist because there's only whiteies in it, or Grand Theft Auto 5 glorifies the killing of women. And shortly thereafter, Jim left the escapist as Bob Chipman did around February 2015. Whether Jim did it because the escapist became pro Gamergate, whether Jim did it because gamers were tired of him de demonizing their genre under falsehoods, we can't be certain, as it seems that Jim was ready to butt off of this molecule of a website to pursue his personal YouTube channel for some time. As I said before, Jim wasn't strongly for or against Gamergate either way, unlike Chipman, which is perhaps why Greg Tito, then escaped the CEO, was more distraught that Jim would leave compared to Bob Chipman. What is strange, however, was that the two people who were on the SJW list for the escapist happened to be axed off at roughly the same time, but again, we'll never know if that was the true intent of Jim's departure. While this was going on, of course, the aforementioned pulling of GTA 5 from targets in Australia because they promote violence against women came about in December of 2014, as I was also at the time getting madly inspired by the hypocrisy and viciousness of postmodern feminism. And Jim Sterling, putting the gloves off of escapists and truly venturing his own personal subjectivity of things, instead of trying to be nuanced on the issue, when this happened, of course, Jim backpedaled the issue like it was nothing. Uh, apparently, the logic is that uh, because I once said that Anita Sarkeesian won't take your video games away from you, because she won't, uh, that, that somehow makes me complicit in the decisions of, of two corporations in another country. <laughs> well, let's consider the obvious. Anita doesn't play video games, and her research, if you can call it that, is obfuscated to make the games she reviews seem worse by comparison. There go, she can easily say that GTA 5 supports violence against women, in spite of said violence being optional, and that you can engage in a lot of violence against men too. What's also funny is that there is a story mission in which you torture a man for information, and the game actively encourages you to rip a tooth off or jumpstart his nipples with a car battery, for instance. But let's keep the Anita misinformation in mind. A bunch of raving fans feminists watch her videos, believe her shit because listen and believe, and then proceed to petition a game's removal because of falsehoods. Do you not see how she could invariably take your games away yet? First of all, let's bat around some misconceptions surrounding the whole thing. GTA 5 has not been 
banned in Australia. I get that a lot. A retail chain choosing not to sell a product is no more a ban than Nintendo electing not to release Captain Rainbow in the United States. It's disappointing that Nintendo America didn't publish Captain Rainbow. It's something I disagree with and feel is misguidedly unfortunate, but it's not been banned. One of the many false equivalencies that Jem will pull out during his span of two inquisitions on his YouTube channel, the difference is th that Nintendo and Japanese companies tend to localize their games to their region for reasons unknown, whereas in this instance, the business is being pressured by moral busybodies to remove a game that was made overseas in spite of how many other games glorify violence per se. Fact is, I see why Target Australia did it. Corporations don't stand by products, they rarely stand by anything, and they'll jettison a product if it's good PR for them. Target projects the image of the family-friendly store. It's where you go when new Transformers and Mario toys are due to be released and there's a chance they're being sold early there. Unlike some suggest, I don't even think it has much to do with GTA being a video game. It has to do with it being an infamous video game. A big deal. A massive media highlight. Again, just like the Breaking Bad toys, it's pulled because it's famous more than for what it is, which if anything is a compliment. When people kick up a stink about you being sold at a major retailer, you damn well hit the big time. Again, if Target wants to paint themselves with this family-friendly industry and GTA is not family-friendly, then they should pull just any M-rated game that has any violence depicted in it because we wouldn't want kids to be traded to murder simulators, would we? Also, Jim is hinging on the fact that GTA is an infinite wormhole of controversy for its overtly misanthropic nature, which is something I never get because GTA is just pixels on the screen interacting with other pixels if we are to be truly 100% objective, Jim! But of course, Jim disagrees with their decision to do so. He exemplifies the disingenuous nature of the petition, the double standard when it comes to the product itself, but my reasons for bringing up this video have more to do with Jim's attempt to make it seem like none of this had anything to do with the sex-negative, backwards-ass regression of media feminists trying to censor video games in any cynical way they could. It was fine when GTA was about violence, but now it isn't when any of it is done to the woman. And who do we have to blame for that, huh? And of course, feminist accountability need not be taken in Jim's world when it comes to them actively censoring things, as he does with the editing versus censorship video, which I won't go into detail because it covers the same ground as Grand Theft Australia did, as Jim just continues to hand wave the notion that feminists didn't cry foul over the Batman cover of Joker, holding Batgirl against her will because how dare a woman be in a compromised position to the glee of a psychopath. Before DOA X3 gets axed off from US shelves and Jim passive aggressively spits in our faces, for some reason or another finds it unique that Fallout 4's relationship with the companions can be gay and or heterosexual. Well, Cover me surprised when you play an RPG, and that's giving Fallout 4 more credit with that genre, and can choose to have a gay relationship with someone, but I for one, never noticed and never really cared anyway. The romancing? You can do it more than once, and it doesn't terminate prior relationships. I found this out after getting romantically involved with one character and then unlocking the option to do it with another. Curious, I decided to go with it, wondering if it'd lead to ending the prior one, making the other person upset or something like that. To my great surprise, nothing was different. I simply had two characters with whom I was in a relationship. And just like that, polyamory was in a mainstream AAA video game. Or that he's fine with polygamy. Call this intent of incompetence, but I don't think it was intended for you to have multiple relationships with people. Not that it is bad, but I think Jim is trying to drag me out of something that he only had the faintest curiosity to do. I feel like we've gotten off track. Look, I'm not a monogamous guy, nor am I a straight one either, and in a world where relationships are almost universally presented in media as being strictly between two folks, preferably of the opposite sex, it's a really big fucking deal to me to see a game where gender and established relationship status are not immutable roles that lock us into place. To say nothing of the fact that this is in one of the biggest fucking games of the year, a major AAA video game that's just like, eh, you wanna have multiple partners across the board? Fine by us, and fine by them. So then comes the question, why are you making a big deal out of it? I didn't notice it, didn't care for it, I was apathetic to it in comparison to the simplified RPG elements of a game that is heralded for being an RPG and of the retarded dialogue wheel that limits your ability, ironically enough, to interact with NPCs, especially companions. I think you put your value in games in the wrong places, 
and just showing how a game could be rudimentally broken, but can be a gold star just because you can fuck the whole world. It doesn't do it any favors for Mass Effect, so why the fuck does Fallout get a free pass? And with this analysis video trekking through Jim's treasured history of being right on the money and dead wrong all the same, is the last video that, while two years old, still carries with me a reminder that Jim fucking Sterling's son is not, in fact, always right. We've seen him backtrack on games being censored, feminists trying to censor games, and of him pushing his feminist values onto games. But I think with Daryl Alive Extreme 3 being shelved from the US shores because of the very nature of these feminists was the point that the only way Jim could win in this situation is to act like it didn't even happen. So here's the pinnacle, the peak, of Jim's bullshit arguments. So here's the thing. I'd love to talk about the recent controversy surrounding Dead or Alive Extreme 3, because I've got a lot to say about it, but I can't. Isn't that a clever way of saying, I can't talk about it because then I have to admit I was wrong about the feminists taking their games away, including Sarkeesian and company. Censored, and ultimately banned by SJWs. Don't ask me how they did this. Don't ask for any details about the boycotting and the censorship at all, actually. Just take my vague word for it, because there's absolutely no need to think critically about this at all, okay? You see what he's doing, right? Because supposedly the removal of the game was vague and directionless, despite that it was in regards to the culture of the West, and that PlayAsia was willing to bring the game to US shelves despite those SJWs anyway, so now he's intentionally acting like there is no such connection between the two. It said everything you wanted me to say. In fact, I can go confidently on record as saying this was the Jimquisition that the hashtag SJWs did not want you to see. Anita Sarkeesian probably campaigned against this episode, or at least I bet she would have. Maybe it had pictures of vaginas in it. Maybe I said something about someone you don't like. You don't know. You can't ever know. Because of censorship. Because of SJWs, definitely. Hey, Jim, can you just... Peel back the sarcasm just a little bit. I get the sense that you're a little bit salty with getting called out of being incorrect about something, because God forbid you make a mistake about raving moral authoritarians taking your medium away in whatever capacity, right? It's okay, Jim. No one's perfect, and certainly you aren't. <sighs> I wish there was some way I had the power to do the episode I'd planned to do, but it's completely out of my hands. This controversy, and that's what this is, it's a fucking controversy, has gotten completely out of control. Everybody's talking about it, I've seen it. What did the Jimquisition say? What rattled the cages of the bloggers who secretly control a multi-million dollar industry? I keep seeing all these tweets, all these MySpace posts, literally everywhere. Everyone cares very much about this, and you should totally be part of the conversation. Well, hey Jim, if it's just a few bloggers, we shouldn't worry, right? You know, it's just a few game journals who presumably give us an idea of what games we should or shouldn't buy, telling us we are bad for being white and straight too, right? You know, it's just a few major corporations who are being forced to include diversity for the sake of it and prioritize it over making a developer's creative vision freedom, right? There's nothing to worry about. War is priests. Freedom is slavery, and resistance is futile. So what can you do to help fight this menace? Well, spread the word. Share this video with everybody you see, because I'm relying on you to help me fight against this totally real boycott that absolutely happened, maybe. In fact, share my whole YouTube channel, the only channel on YouTube that's dedicated to your right to consume any content you want, unchallenged and uncriticized, just the way you like it. You know, I'm all about creating the safe space you want, where nobody debates the merit of the entertainment you consume. Especially share the ad-supported videos, because they'll help out this cause the most somehow. Oh yeah, Jim, sure. It's the gamers who aren't concerned about criticizing the games, and the feminists who are so nuanced as to say that GTA 5 supports violence against the woman primarily. And when it's something they don't like, they're the ones who boycott the game from other places, and not the ideologically dogmatic, who have to make everything sanitary lest they cry themselves into a coma. Is this how you picture the gaming uh, community, Jimbo? Purchase them as a show of solidarity and a way of telling the world you're sick of being manipulated and treated like idiots by other people. Purchase this product. Purchase the things I'm selling you. It's the only way to be an active participant in the fight for our freedom. Purchase and consume. Purchase. Consume. You know, Jim, 
I'd rather be considered an idiot that buys shit gleefully than someone who is evil by virtue of conditions I couldn't control. But hey, there's Hatred, a game that by all accounts is an edgy arcade top-down shooter that other loony snowflakes got offended by, who unironically will say that will turn people into school shooters. Gamer, by all accounts, is the new Jew in terms of the ultimate scapegoat for anything. Now, some people have accused me of making up this controversy from whole cloth in order to gain attention and sucker a bunch of chumps into doing my marketing for me, but that only proves they're part of the malicious conspiracy centered entirely around silencing my message. And you can find out all about this conspiracy in my upcoming documentary, Hashtag SJWs, Inside the Secret Video Game Badness That's Scary and Will Hurt You. This documentary will soon launch on Kickstarter with a funding goal of, um, uh, let's see, flip video camera, uh, laptop with Windows Movie Maker on it, carry the two, oh, plus the new 4K HD TV I want, um, <clears throat> uh, let's say $76,000, we'll start from there, yeah? Thank you for your support in this trying time, as the episode I totally planned on releasing isn't releasing anymore because of some people you hate, and that's why you need to give me all your money. It's the smart thing to do. I I'm just baffled that Jim would say this, like as if Ania didn't do the exact same thing with the pretense of fighting for her cause when she came in with a conclusion and points that fit her bias. Or that play Asian DOA X3, which is a publicity front to sell their game under the idea it was being boycotted by SJWs, when it's more indicative that they could even do that, which should tell you all you need to know of what gamers think of SJWs. But hey, since they marketed that way, similarly to Overwatch's Tracer pose game changed for the sluttier by a moral busybody, that completely erases the fact that there even exist moral busybodies who are trying to take your games away, huh? I also want to normally do this, but seeing as this is the last video I want to cover in length to the Jimquisition, this video is definitely the most pluralizing of his, with a like to dislike ratio nearly at a 1 to 1 scale, with commenters showing the flagrant hypocrisy of not only this video, but of videos before like the aforementioned Fallout 4 relationship video. What's also interesting, interesting about all of these comments is that they have a familiar pattern. They all champion Jim for him pointing out the cynical design of the AAA industry, the bullshit publisher practices, the overwhelming DLC, pre-orders, and microtransactions ham-fisted in, values of which a common gamer cares about, and not whether they can play as a they or a Z. They see the value that Jim Sterling has in critiquing certain parts of the game industry, but not the pervasive nature of identity politics taking advantage of a crippled industry to suit their own ends. He is incredulous to what happened with Gamergate. He is infinitely doubtful of SJWs or feminazis attempting to coerce and intimidate creative decisions out and pr products from even existing. And when the facts are laid out straight to him, he decides that it's opportunity to make it seem like the gamers are being the crazies and not the very people who will take this medium from under him while saying that it's still there. This inability to come to terms with the fact that he's incorrect or that SJWs are a problem is the very reason many people decide to axe Jim Sterling off entirely as a viable source of gaming credibility. But even I know the fault with doing that. You got to take the rough with the smooth and see some of the value in any argument. Hell, even Sarkeesian could pull this off, albeit rarely. Some aren't able to and dismiss it, others are blind to it and side with his word like gospel, but Jim himself a while back said that he wasn't a perfect person, that he can let his bias get the best of him, and while I don't think he'd carry that staple now or in the future, it's something to keep in mind when you consider any kind of argument. And that is that with what you need to know of the Jim Quisition and Jim Sterling. There are plenty of other videos I take umbrage with him, like with O oh, Virginia, in which he demonstrates how the other side can assume that a character was put in for the sake of diversity while not sympathizing with that reaction, continuing to have a problem with sexy female characters like with Shakshi Shilob, using false equivalencies to compare PewDiePie saying a bad word on a stream to people manipulating others to gamble their savings away on the pretense of gaining good odds on fictional weapons. The works, but all in all, I still watch his videos because I still believe he has good insight into the bloating problems of the industry, and not the ill-conceived ones. I'll end this on a bit of a drama spiral that hit Jim around early 2015 had with the slaughtering grounds in Digital Homicide. Jim critiques the game for it being obviously shit and reusing assets, or in this case, 
asset flipping as the vernacular, and the company seeks to destroy him and his credibility by making falsehoods abundant. They continue to churn out games with the same asset flip nonsense. Jim digs into them, being reminded of them, and how they gave him the nickname Jim fucking Sterling's son, and mentioning his affair with them. It builds up to the extent that one of the publishers tries to sue Jim for defamatory and slander and the usual catch-alls for the exorbitant price, and of course, Jim wants to go to trial for it, only for the cases to be dropped, as it was merely a means to intimidate Jim out of criticizing their scummy behavior. Why I bring this up? is that the person behind Digital Homicide is no better than the very SJWs that try to bully, corral, and threaten developers into creative silence because their vision doesn't match theirs, and these SJWs in particular aren't damned to make their own version of a game. It's these SJWs that will literally eat their own when they want to make a feminist game with their own funds and own creative vision because, of course, it isn't their subjective vision. And I think that Jim Sterling is doing a great disservice to himself and the community for not recognizing that what he has gone through is what these developers have gone through to even have their game be released outside of their shores, unless well, have a vision that doesn't tie to theirs. I think if he were to humble and show cordiality to the people who have talked at great lengths of this pernicious ideology infecting all mediums, not just games, I think people like Rags and Sargon of Akkad would not write him off so easily.